Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, super excited for today's highly anticipated webinar. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled. I know you all are too. I know I know nobody's here to see me. Uh, that we're being joined today by Morgan Housel. So Morgan, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm here to see you, Caleb. So this is exciting for me. I know we're we're, we're all excited, but thank you everyone uh, for joining today. Some of you doing this in the middle of the workday. That's okay. Tell your boss it's fine. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's it's an honor for That's me right. to get to do this and to get to speak, everyone. Caleb, should, uh, sorry, is there is there is there more to go through? Am I, am I, am I jumping the gun? Yeah, here? I got a few more things. I got a few more All things, right. and I'll set you loose. Um, I did want to you know start by just giving everybody a little background on you, Morgan, a little bit about you. Um, obviously, you're widely recognized in our industry. Um, you know, your deep understanding of the markets, economics, and especially human behavior. You know, I think are uh, some trademarks of, of why people know you so well. Um, formerly, you're a partner at the Collaboration Fund, right? Um, I especially like the blog that, that you all put together there and, and your post. So if anybody that's listening today hasn't checked out that blog, definitely do so. Uh, it's it's thought provoking, it's entertaining and, and just light enough to be really fun to read. Um, and of course, uh, a very accomplished author, right? So your book, The Psychology of Money, uh, sold over 3 million copies already and you've got another one on the way, is that right? That's right, yep. Same as ever comes out November 7th. All right, excited for that. Uh, you can pre-order it if you haven't already. Um, I, I know it's going to be great, um, but really excited to have you today. Share some wisdom. I I've seen your visuals. I, I got to look through the deck. I think I'm as in the dark as everybody else about what you're going to say, though. Even after seeing that, so I'm super intrigued to see how you pull it all together. Uh, I'll turn it over a couple of quick housekeeping items. One, um, we're going to save a lot of time for Q and A, but we're going to do our best too. So everybody that's listening, uh, use the chat function uh, within Zoom to type in questions. We're, we're not gonna take them live uh, during the, the presentation, but we will at the end. So uh, Morgan's gonna save some time at the end and we'll dive, dive into those questions. So please get them in there. Uh, also um, a replay of this or a recording is gonna be sent out. You'll also be able to access it on our YouTube channel. Uh, be sure to like it on YouTube and subscribe there if you want more content like this. And also you'll see a QR code from time to time. Uh, if you scan that uh, on the presentation here, that'll allow you to start a free trial of Y charts and test out our software. But um, that's all I had, enough from me. I'm actually gonna go dark here, turn things over to you, Morgan, to go through your presentation, and I'll jump back on at the end for Q&A. So take it away. Thanks so much, Caleb. Again, it's a, it's an honor to, to get to do this. I'm glad we can do this. Even if it's not live and in person, it's always fun to get to do this and get to talk to you. I wanna talk a little bit first about, a little bit about my background and why I became interested in this topic, the psychology of money. The psychology of money means I'm not going to give you any lectures about where I think the market's going to go next or how the economy is doing. I've, I've really never been that interested in that topic, but I've always been really interested in just what's going on inside of people's heads and what's going on inside of my own head, trying to make sense of that when we make decisions with money. And I started as a financial writer in 2008, which was an interesting time, of course, to begin that endeavor because the world was melting down in pieces all around us. That was the great financial crisis. And I started the, with the first few years of my career, just trying to answer the question as a writer, what happened? What happened in 2008? How do you explain the housing bubble that preceded the crisis? How do you explain the meltdown in 2008? Everything from the housing bubble to Lehman Brothers melting down, just trying to make sense of what it all was. And I realized that as years went on, that if you were trying to explain the financial crisis through the lens of finance and economics, it didn't make any sense. Like there was nothing in there that could accurately explain why people did what they did. Nothing in a finance textbook, nothing in an economics textbook that could really explain what was going on here. And that to me was always fascinating because I was a student of economics. And back then I was, uh, you took a very analytical approach to how I looked at markets and how I looked at the economy. And there was really nothing in there that could explain it. But if you were looking through the lens of psychology or sociology or political science or biology or evolution or military history, all of these fields that had nothing to do with investing perfectly explained exactly what was going on. Like greed and fear, that's all psychology. Keeping up with the Joneses during the housing bubble, that's all sociology. All of the rules and regulations that played a role, that's all political science. How companies adapt, how banks adapt, that's all like study of evolution. There were so many answers to what was going on, to questions that I think finance and economics had a blind spot in. And that to me just opened up this idea that investing was not really the study of finance. That's how it's taught, but that's not really what it was. Investing is the study of how people make decisions with money. 
how people behave with money. And behavior is such a big, broad field that impacts virtually every area of your life that it was actually like that opened the door to, okay, some of the most important financial topics and investing topics and economics topics, you can only learn about if you are not looking through the lens of finance and economics. And there are so many things that you can learn in all of these random fields that have nothing to do with finance that explain exactly what's going on. And as a writer, this was great because when you explain the economy and investing and finance through the lens of these stories and lessons that have nothing to do with finance, for one, I think it was more exciting. It was easier to catch people's attention if you could explain compound interest with a story about icebergs or something like that. But I, th I also think it got you closer to the truth. It got you closer to this idea of what markets are and how people make decisions with their money. It's not about the spreadsheets. It's not about the formulas. It's just the messy behavior inside of people's heads. And I've always thought that people don't make financial decisions on a spreadsheet. They make them at the dinner table where it's not just about how the numbers all align. It's about all of the messy social aspects that you have going on and family dynamics and people's different social aspirations and their risk tolerance and their time horizon. It's much messier than it's made out to be. And so what I want to do with you right now in the, in the few more minutes I have to, uh, to, to blab for you here is share with you a story or two, which has nothing to do with finance at all, it has nothing to do with economics, but I think it has a very clear takeaway about how people make decisions with their money. So this story that I want to talk about today is what I call goalposts, one of my favorite stories here. And again, it has nothing to do with finance or economics. It's a story about this guy right here, Stephen Hawking, who was, of course, without exaggeration, one of the smartest people to walk this planet in the last hundred years. I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. He was just an absolute genius savant at understanding astrophysics and how the world worked. And he could explain it in layman terms better than almost anybody. And of course, a quirk of Stephen Hawking was that he had a motor neuron disease and he was paralyzed from head to toe. He had no control over his body whatsoever. And he was not born like this. He was born a perfectly healthy, able-bodied child who was actually an athlete in college. He was on the crew team at Cambridge. And he became afflicted with this disease at age 21. And he kind of lost control over his body shortly after that. Now, a few years before Stephen Hawking died, uh, he did an interview with the New York Times. And during the interview, he started talking about how happy he was and how amazing his life was and how lucky he was to be getting to do the research that he was doing, which is an interesting mentality for a guy whose life ended up like this. Like if there's one person who has the right to complain about how their life has turned up, it's somebody like this. And he wasn't. He was like the happiest guy that they had, they had talked to. And so the New York Times asked him, they said, what is your secret to happiness? Like, seriously, wh how are you this happy? And his answer I thought was so good. He said, quote, my expectations were reduced to zero when I was 21. Everything else since then has been a bonus. And I, I've always just loved that idea that however much benefit or value you get out of anything in life, it's not about your circumstances. It's your circumstances relative to your expectations that makes all of the difference in the world. And literally, you can, be the hap you can have the best circumstances you can possibly imagine and be miserable, or vice versa. You can, kind of, you can end up paralyzed and be super happy if your expectations are properly set. That's a pretty powerful idea that I think impacts a lot of areas in life, including, if not especially, how people think about money. And I'll show you what I mean. If you ask most Americans, when was the greatest period economically in the history of our country? Overwhelmingly, they point to one period, one decade as the peak of economic prosperity, and that is the 1950s. The 1950s is what people across generations remember as being this amazing time of middle class prosperity when everyone was doing great, everyone who was willing to work hard was doing great. And this is not just how we remember it today. We knew it at the time that the 50s were this incredible period. Life magazine, where I stole this picture from, they wrote in 1953 that, quote, the present and immediate future seem astonishingly good. The country has just lived through what was economically the greatest year in its history. So we, re we, we remember today and we, we knew back and, and we knew back then that the 50s were like this amazing period in the history of this country. And what's so interesting to me about that nostalgia for the 50s that we remember is how easy it is to show 
with numbers that the 50s were not this great period economically, that most people were not better off then than they were now. And it's not even close. I mean, if you go back to the 1950s, the median household income adjusted for inflation, the typical household adjusted for inflation income was about $29,000 per year. And today it's about $64,000 per year. Adjusted for inflation, the typical household, not everybody, is earning more than twice today what they were during the glorious 1950s that we remember so well. Part of this is the rise in female labor force participation. There are more workers per household today than there were in the 50s, but that's only a small part of what's going on here. If you look at average hourly wages adjusted for inflation, it's roughly double today what they were back in the 1950s. And you keep on going down the list of what it was like back during the the golden age of the 50s. The average new house was 37% smaller in the 50s than it is today. The average new house in the 50s had but one bathroom for four people. Today, we have three bathrooms for two people. We've gone the other direction. Maybe that's, that's, that's what progress looks like. Food took up an average of 30% of an average household's budget compared to less than 13% today. Workplace deaths were about three times higher back then than they are today. And maybe this is most important. Half of men over age 65, were still working in the 50s, compared with less than a quarter today. Most people in the 50s worked until they died. That was everyone's expectation. That was the reality. And the idea that people were going to have a dignified retirement for them just was not in the national psyche back then. It was not in people's expectations. And I think if you keep going down the list like this, by almost any metric you, will, you can measure this by, People are way better off today than they were in the 50s, at least at the median level. Not everybody, of course. That's never going to be the case. And then so the question is, why the nostalgia? Why do we remember the 50s so well and so fondly if just statistically they were not that good? And there could be a lot of answers to that question, one of which is this was just coming out of the Great Depression after World War II. So just by comparison of what it was, the 50s felt amazing. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think one of the answers to this question is this. The 50s were this very unique period in Western history because for a brief period of time, for 10 or 15 years, there was very little wealth inequality. The, the distribution between rich and poor just got very flat all of a sudden. Most of that was a consequence of World War II, just an echo of World War II, of how companies were managed, how salaries were doled out. The top marginal tax rate, of course, was 91% in the 50s. And so it, just, it was an era where you did not have CEOs who were making $50 million a year. You didn't have athletes making $30 million a year. There were no billionaire hedge fund managers. It just did not exist by and large during that era. And I'm not saying that was good or better, but for better or worse, it did something very important to people's mindsets, which is that it created an era where it was easy to keep your expectations in check. There's no such thing as an objective measure of wealth. Everything is just relative to that person, relative to other people. And whenever anyone is measuring and sizing up how well they're doing financially, how they do it is just say, how much do I have relative to that person? And in the 1950s, when there was very little wealth inequality, the majority of Americans could look around at their neighbors and their coworkers and their siblings and say, relative to that person, I'm doing pretty well. I'm probably doing at least as well as them. And therefore, the, the smaller wages back then felt fine because that's what everybody else was earning. And the smaller houses were fine because everybody else lived in a small house. And going camping for your summer vacation seemed awesome because that's what everybody else did. And I think what's happened over the last 80 years or so, to generalize it, is that our wages have doubled, as I showed you, but our expectations have more than doubled. And so even if we are statistically doing much better off today, it doesn't feel like it. Because by comparison, when you compare yourself to other people today, where there is a much deeper stratification across the economy, it's easier to feel like you're doing worse off, even if your income has surged relative to what it would have been in a different generation. Social media like pours gasoline on the fire of this problem. Because now the people who are, you are, you are uh, uh, measuring yourself against is a curated highlight reel, an algorithmic highlight reel of everyone's fake life. Someone phrased this to me the other day. I thought it was so brilliant. They said, we went from keeping up with the Joneses to keeping up with the Kardashians. And that's exactly what has happened. And I think it has just inflated everybody's expectation of what doing well financially actually is. Because now instead of comparing yourself to your neighbors and your coworkers, 
you're comparing yourself to people who are posting this fake life of who they are. And if you want to see how powerful this really is, talk to a teenager today who has spent their entire life on social media. And almost, almost without exception, their definition of a good life is like a private jet and a private island and a Rolls Royce because that's what they are exposed to and that's who they are comparing themselves to. And so I think since this phenomenon in social media is still relatively new, I don't think we know how powerful this is going to be. Other than if I had to make a prediction, it would be that even if we have strong, great, even massive economic growth over the next 20 or 30 years, it's not going to feel that great for most people because their expectations have already risen or are going to keep rising just as quickly. And so if there is a takeaway from this of how we can think about this, it's just a realization that if your expectations grow faster than your income, you will never be happy with your money. And this, I think, is like an iron rule of finance that has to be obeyed no matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter. $10,000 a year, $10 million a year, this impacts everybody. And in a strange way, I almost think that the higher your income, the more susceptible you are to this. Because the higher the income you get, the more you start getting into just a competition with your neighbors and your friends over whose car is faster and whose boat is bigger and whose house is larger. And so this tends to like spiral out of control for people. And this is part of the explanation of why money doesn't, by and large, bring happiness to a lot of people. I mean, to some extent it does, but this tends to be why it's a more complicated equation than that. It's just because their expectations are blowing out of control. And I'll show you an extreme example of what happens when your expectations do kind of spin out of control. Everyone here recognizes this guy here, this jerk Bernie Madoff, of course. The biggest financial fraudster of all time, stole $30 billion from investors, died a couple of years ago. Uh, to me, the most interesting part of the Madoff story that was almost completely overlooked when he was caught in 2008 is that if you go back to the early 1980s, before his Ponzi scheme began, before the fraud, he was earning by some accounts like $20 million a year from the legitimate side of his business. Not from the fraud, not from the Ponzi scheme, from his real legitimate business as a market maker on Wall Street. He was earning by some accounts $20 million a year. Honestly, one of the most successful businessmen in the entire country from the legitimate side. Like we will never remember him for this, but he was instrumental in building the NASDAQ. Like he had a legitimate non-fraudulent career and he was so successful at it. And to me, what is so astounding is that despite that success, and despite that wealth, he wanted more money so badly that he was willing to start this fraud that ruined everything for him. And his son committed suicide because of the fraud. It couldn't have been worse. And look, if you are broke and you have a starving child at home and you go out and you rob a grocery store or something, I can understand that crime. I can wrap my head around that logic of why you would do that. But when you have this much and you still stoop to those levels, that to me is just astounding. It's a fascinating aspect of what he did. And I think there's something here to learn for all of us, because I think every one of us, me, you, all of us, have a little bit of this in us, that if we are lucky enough to have a rising income or a rising net worth, but our expectations rise by even more, it's never going to feel like it's enough. And when it never feels like it's enough, the innocent version of what happens here is hopefully not that you go out and start a Ponzi scheme, heaven forbid. The innocent version is that when it never feels like enough, people take more risk, more risk, more risk until it blows up in their face. Or they work longer hours, longer hours, longer hours, more career ambition until that blows up in their face and they realize that their family life has kind of disintegrated. Happens to the most well-meaning people all of the time. And I think the root of it is when your expectations are growing faster than your income. I think especially for most people on this call, many of you are financial professionals, tends to be one of the biggest problems because not only do most financial professionals have an above average income, but so many of them, because they are in finance, have the opportunity and the means to keep taking more risk, more risk, more risk until it blows up in front of their face. There's a great quote from Warren Buffett where he says, if you risk what you need and able to gain what you don't need, that is foolish. That is just plain foolish. And I think so many of us in this industry, and even not in the industry, do that. We risk what we need in order to gain what we don't. need. And to me, it's always been fascinating, and this is the root of it. So one last little quick story that I, I, I use in the book that's one of my favorites, it's actually framed on the wall behind me here, is that many years ago, two famous authors, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller, were having lunch at the house of a hedge fund manager in the Hamptons. 
And Kurt Vonnegut turned to Joseph Heller and he said, Joseph, do you know the owner of this house? The hedge fund manager makes more money per month than you have earned in your entire life. And Joseph Heller said, that might be true, but I have something that the hedge fund manager will never have. And that is enough money. Just enough. I think that is, that is probably the most important word that exists in finance. It's not risk. It's not re return. It's not standard deviation. The most important word that exists is enough. At the personal finance level, at the investing level, all of it. And I'll tell you something important about enough that tends to go missing and misunderstood is that having enough does not mean that you have no desire for more. Like I, I want more money. Of course, everybody does. You do, everybody does. You're never going to get to a point when you say, I, have, I want absolutely no more money. Having enough just means that you realize that if your expectations grow faster than your income, it's never going to feel like it's enough and that you need to get, spend as much of your effort managing your expectations as you do growing your circumstances, improving your, your income and your net worth. And I think that tends to go overlooked in the industry. It feels like virtually all of the effort in this industry goes towards growing your net worth, improving your returns, which is great. That's all very important. Of course it is. I'm not going to poo-poo that, but there's almost a complete ignorance of the expectation side of it. And back to the lessons of Stephen Hawking, I think this is like the most important thing. One of the things I wrote in my book that was made a big difference in my life is just the idea that like, if I could be happy and live a great life with 8% returns in my portfolio, but you need 10% returns a year to be happy or whatever the numbers would be. Like that's a massive advantage I have in my life. And I think that is a, a true thing too. Like the lower your expectations, the happier you're going to be with your money, with investing results and whatnot. That's a pretty important thing. I'm going to skip ahead, skip ahead just a few slides here to get to the, the, this portion here. But one of the things I've always thought about too, that was so important to me as it pertains to expectations was when I was in college, I was a valet at a five-star hotel in Los Angeles. And it was my first like experience and exposure to very wealthy people. And since it was Los Angeles in the mid 2000s, it was a lot of like materialistic wealth, flashy wealth. And so whenever people would drive into the hotel with a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce or whatever it would be, never once would I look at the driver of that car and say, wow, the driver is so cool. Never once did I do that. What I did is I imagined myself as the driver and I thought, wow, if I was a driver, people would think I'm cool. And then one day it was like, hey, do you see the irony of this? You, nobody cares about the driver, but they want to be the driver because they think people will care about them. And that to me was just like one of the great paradoxes of wealth. And the takeaway was nobody's thinking about you as much as you are. Nobody cares about your stuff as much as you do. They're busy thinking about themselves. And that's true, not just for cars, but for the house you live in, the clothes you wear, the investing returns that you earn, nobody is as impressed with them as you are. And that was a really important uh, realization for expectations because you just kind of identify the game that's being played. Everyone is trying to impress other people and those people are not paying as much attention to them as they think. And once you identify that game and the rules of that game, then I think your materialistic aspirations fall quite a bit. Not, not to zero, because I like nice cars and nice homes, of course. But when you identify that game, it makes it much easier to keep your expectations in check. And when you do that, you're not only happier with your money, but you have this massive like, leverage within your finances. I've always thought the easiest way to have less money is, to spe is spending money to show people how much money you have. And there is so much of that all over the economy, particularly in the social media age. So I'm going to end my remarks there, but I think we have plenty of time now for some questions and a, a, a lively discussion, I hope. So fire those questions away. Thanks again for having me. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. And thanks for saving time for questions here. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a few that actually came in ahead of time from a couple of our maybe common friends over Twitter. Um, first one's from Ryan Dietrich, and he wanted to know, what, what's the one trait that the very best investors possess? I remember, I, I think there, there's a quote, I forget who, who had this quote, but like, it's a, it's a combination of patience and a calculator, like pretty, pretty, pretty simple stuff. One of the things that I do think there is a common theme of, and this is, it's almost cliche to say, but I think there's, uh, there's a couple of variations to this that I like, which is that they're not afraid to look dumb. They're not afraid to look stupid. Uh, 
And that is extremely rare. And it's, it's extremely rare, not because people don't possess that trait, but because of the investing structure that they have, the fund structure that they have doesn't allow them to do it. I mean, there's, I remember in, uh, in uh, October of 2008, which was when the market was, was bottoming, it was down 50% or whatever it was during the financial crisis. I, I was watching a segment of CNBC and I remember it was David Faber who had like three traders on that he was interviewing. And every single one of them said, this is the market bottom. We totally feel like this is the bottom. And David Faber said, great. How are you guys investing? All three of them said they were 100% cash. And he was like, I don't understand it. And they all said it's because they can't report another month of loss to their investors. They're like their investors just wouldn't be able to handle it anymore. So even if you have an investor who understands like long-term markets and like be, be greedy when others are fearful, if you have clients who don't understand that, it makes it virtually impossible to get into it. And I think if you look at the most successful investors all the time, so many of them either have a structure like Berkshire Hathaway which it is where it's like, it's a, it's a permanent set of capital. Your investors can't just flee tomorrow and withdraw their money. It doesn't work like that. Or what so many of them do is they have a successful career as a hedge fund and then they convert to a family office where they don't have to deal with, <laughs> with other investors like that. So that's a big one that tends to go overlooked. It's just like the structure that you are investing in. And even at the individual level, if you're talking about your own portfolio, what happens to a lot of people is maybe you yourself uh, have the stomach and the wherewithal to be a long-term investor and to put up with volatility. Maybe your spouse doesn't. That happens to a lot of people where it's like, you want to keep going, but your husband or your wife doesn't. And therefore you have to. So that's where like the social aspect of this really comes, uh, really comes together. The other thing that I think is, is a trait that ruins a lot of investors, and that's probably the right word, is mistaking that there is virtually no correlation between effort and results in investing. And that is rare because in almost every other endeavor of your life, there's a strict correlation between action and results. Like if you want to get in good physical shape, go to the gym and sweat and grunt. That's how you do it. If you want to get better at golf, go to the range and hit golf balls for three hours. That's how you get better. And people take that idea to investing. And they're like, if I want to get good at investing, how do I have the most number of knobs and levers to fiddle with in my portfolio? And they do it with intention. Like if you try harder, you should do better. And so many of the greatest investors don't have that. Even if you're talking about like a trading hedge fund, so many of those guys will be more or less inactive a lot of the time. And then when the world things hit the fan and things get crazy, that's when they go in and they're very active, but they have no problem keeping their activity fairly simple and hands off when it needs to be. And they just realize that there's not necessarily a correlation between activity and results. I think those two things are, are really what stick out to me. I think it's a good answer. There's a handful of questions that have come in and I, I think they summarize to the same kind of theme here. So I'm going to try to sum it up, but you, you spent a lot of time talking about managing expectations. And I think the more you manage those expectations and the more you think about, uh, you know, those questions you asked about, you know, when is enough enough, probably, you know, the more you, or, or I guess the less you realize you actually need, how do you balance that with seeking higher income and, and seeking a higher net worth and nice things, especially when you're giving advice to other people? I think for me, well, the first thing I say is it's obviously different for, for everyone. And just because I have my own financial goals and, and, and needs out of money, it doesn't mean it's going to be right for you or anyone else. In fact, it almost certainly is not. But for me, it was the big point was, and, and this I, I think is not that rare. It was, I want to become rich so I can be independent. I want to be rich so that I can just wake up and do whatever I want and work for who I want, work when I want, work for as long as I want, travel when I want, retire when I want, whatever it would be. I just don't want people telling me what to do in that area of my life. And I think that is actually people either recognize that or it's true for them, but they haven't recognized it yet. And that's very different, of course, from the knee-jerk reaction of, I want more money so I can have nice stuff, which is what it is for most people, particularly younger people. But once you identify independence as, like, as the, the scoreboard of the game that you're playing, then I think the uh, ambition for more and you, your ability to have enough is much easier. Because I think for a lot of people, the ambition for, is more stuff more cars, more houses, more spending, which again is like, it's great. Like I, I want nice stuff too. But if the goal is independence, then it's easier to be like, oh, I have, I already have enough and I'm just piling up to give me like more independence. And the other people, I think you would, uh, you'll also find that with rare exceptions, most people who are very wealthy just love what they do and they're not necessarily doing it for the money. Uh, there's actually this, this fascinating quote I heard recently from George Soros where 
somebody asked him, they said, how old were you when you realized that you loved making money? And George Soros said, I don't love it. I'm just very good at it. And I, I love that story, because, but I think that's actually extremely rare for someone to, to be that successful and not love what they do. And most of these people, uh, no, I'm not talking about like the, the, the deck of billionaires, but even most like successful small businessmen, they either absolutely love it or it's just so ingrained in their identity that they could not live with themselves if they weren't doing what they were doing. And that's actually their drive for money. And most people who are focusing their career on how do I get rich are, are the first people to burn out after two or three years. That's, I, I think those two things are, really get into how you can actually have enough in life. So is it fair to say, though, then uh, enough kind of has a, a minimum threshold? Uh, I mean, if you're talking about independence, you have to have enough to get there, which is still a significant amount. And the, I guess, the grind and the work and the effort and kind of accumulating wealth up to that point is all still noble. I think it's definitely true, but independence exists on a spectrum. I think a lot of people view the phrase financial independence as I have enough money to never work ever again. And that's one level of independence. But every, every dollar that you save is a piece of your future that you have a claim to. And every dollar of debt that you have is a piece of your future that somebody else has a claim to. And so, I mean, at, at, the, at lower levels, if you have $1,000 in savings, that might make it so that if you get laid off, you can spend a week looking for your next job rather than having, having to take the, the first one that you come across. So like the, it's always a, a very wide spectrum. And there's also too, like people's goals shift over time. I have two young kids and I always, it's astounding to me. My oldest is seven. My youngest is four. How much my goals have changed in the last seven years. And I think every parent can relate to that. Where, and, and so to me, the takeaway from that is I, I should not be surprised if seven years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, my goals are completely different then as well. If I've changed this much in the last seven years, I'm probably going to change again over the next seven or 10 years. And so even if I, I think I think a lot of people in the fire movement, the financial independence, retire early movement, get this wrong. Because some of, if, if you, you know, retire when you're 24 and you say, oh, I have enough money to live this life forever. And even if like on the spreadsheet, that's true. Don't pretend that you're going to be the same person at 34 than you were at 24. And at 44 and 54, you're going to be a completely different person with different needs, different wants, different desires. So I think it's actually, this is one of the areas where like long-term planning gets tough because it's hard to make a 20 or a 50 year financial plan when you're going to completely change as a person every 10 years. And I would not be surprised. In fact, I would, I'm almost certain that 10, 20 years from now, there will be portions of my book that I completely disagree with. And I think it's just because I'm hopefully going to change and grow as a person. So that's why like the concept of enough too is always, it exists on a spectrum and it's a fluid thing. I mean, to put like a fine point on this, and this gets back to like relative values and whatnot. There's a Chris Rock joke that I love where he says, uh, if, if, if Bill Gates woke up with Oprah's money, he'd jump out the window. And like most comedians, like it's funny because there's truth to it. It's all relative. And everybody has this idea of like, once my net worth is X, everything's going to be great. And then when they get to X, whatever it is, like the goalpost just shifts. So that's keeping your expectations in check, but just acknowledging that that's by and large how the game works. It's just, you're always going to be kind of be chasing things. Uh, just, just acknowledging that that's how it works, I think is a big step in the right direction. When you talk about that long-term perspective and you especially talk about younger people, I think there's a couple you know, younger people that have asked questions here today too. What's some great advice you'd give somebody maybe in their twenties um, you know, that's starting to think about their wealth and how they should be positioning for enough and saving um, you know, with all of those things in mind? I mean, there's two things that come up. One is it's very likely, if not certain, that the majority of people, the job that they're doing in their 20s is not what they're going to end up doing for the bulk of their career. And one thing that was become obvious for me, I don't want to pretend like I'm, I'm the old gray hair guy here, but as I've gotten older, it's, it's been clear that if you're going to make a lot of decisions, make them when you're young. Like if you're going to, if you're going to quit and panic, panic early. And so that's what, I, whenever I see someone who is 23 and not liking their job, I'm like, get out today, quit today, because it's going to be a lot harder to quit when you're 38 and you're married with kids much, much harder. So that's, that's when you're 28. Like if there's time for volatility in your career, make it then, and don't be ashamed to make it then. Cause it's going to get exponentially harder as you get early, as you get older. And I feel I, it, it stings when I see someone who is in their late 40s or 50s and miserable in their career because it is really hard to change your career at that stage in your life. It's not impossible, but it's much harder. That's the first thing. The other that's 
virtually cliche, but it's cliche for a reason because it's so important. It's just realizing that a young person might have a low net worth, but they are time billionaires. And when you realize that compound interest is just returns to the power of time, time is the exponent that does all the heavy lifting. That's where returns are made. It's not, it's not about how high your returns are. It's what returns you can sustain for the longest period of time. And so again, it's cliche to like tell a young person, you have your time horizon is 50 years in front of you. Like, please take advantage of that. But it's cliche for, again, it's cliche for a reason. It's, it's the most important thing. And they, every 20 year old has an asset and a skill that Warren Buffett can never emulate or replicate. And I write in my book too, that that is why Warren Buffett is rich. It's not because he's earned extremely high returns. He's earned good returns. He's rich because he's been investing for 80 years. He started investing when he was 11 and he's 92, I think today. And I show in the book too, that there are all these hypothetical calculations you can make of, let's say Warren Buffett retired at age 60, like a normal person. His, his net worth would be 99% less today than it actually is. Like all of his success is because of how long he's been investing for. So that's, that's, those are the two things that, that really come to mind for young people. And, and Morgan, you mentioned your kids. You mentioned being a father. Talk about being a parent, you know, in the age of, of Instagram and everything you were talking about on social media and, uh, you know, people growing up having that, uh, I guess, out of balance expectation of, of what wealth and a happy life means. How, how, do, you, how do you handle that one? It, it's tough. What, what frightens me the most, as I said earlier, is you see, so my, my generation, social media came when we were teens late or teens or early twenties, like, the, like thereabouts. By and large, we are like, our brains were kind of mostly established by that. So social media was like a new tool for kids who grew up with social media. It's completely different. It's not a new tool. It's their life. It's so ingrained in their life. And you really see this with whatnot. For me, if, when, I, when I witness it, I'm sure it's different for every parent, but it's not TikTok or Instagram. It's YouTube that has them so incredibly sucked in. And a lot of it is like good, decent content. It's not all just garbage out there. But when I was growing up, it was TV. And we, were, and we sat in front of the TV all day, but you had like 20 channels. And if you liked your show, you had to wait until 7 p.m. when it came on. Whereas YouTube is, is virtually infinite. It's virtually bottomless and they know exactly what you want. And I have seen with my own son how powerful the marketing on YouTube can be. And it is so much more powerful than the commercial marketing on TV that we grew up with. It's a hundred times as powerful on them. Uh, so that, you know, like they're going to grow up with a totally different set of expectations and influences than we did. And I think for a, most of the last hundred years, there was a lot of change in media, but it was growing at like a linear rate. In the last 10 years, it went exponential. And so we don't know what that's going to do to them. Some of it might be great. They might all be like way more creative and way more entrepreneurial because they've grown up with Mr. Beast or whatnot. But I think there's a lot of damage that's already been measured. Jonathan Haidt, who I think is at uh, NYU, has done the most, and to me, the most interesting research on the damage that social media has done to teens and what it's done to teenage depression, teenage suicide attempts all on down is terrifying. And you can link it directly, not just correlation, but causation to when Facebook mobile came out. That was like, it was like a quantum shift that took place. So to me, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, it, it, it's amazing, but it's also terrifying as a parent to see that there is this algorithm that has more influence over my children than we do. It's scary to say that, but I think it's, I think it's undoubtedly true. Any advice? <laughs> you, you painted a grim picture, I guess, but what's the, what, what's the takeaway? Here's, well, here's, here's, this is not advice or a takeaway, but the, uh, another hard element here is that if, you're, if your solution for the kids is you don't get social media, your kids are then going to be social outcasts. If you're a 16-year-old and you're not on TikTok, you're a social outcast. You kind of have to have it to be ingrained in your social group, which makes this all the much harder. Um, you know, I've, I, I have, I, I guess if we're looking for takeaways here, I, you know, we're, we're definitely going down a rabbit hole, but most of those platforms, you can, there are some parental controls and you can say like, look, this channel that my son was watching, I actually don't like that. Let's like block that on their channel. Like there, there, there is some way to get into it, but that works when your kids are younger, when your kids are 16, like forget about it. I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's no holds barred then. I, All so right. I, 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 I guess the answer is I don't really have any firm takeaways. Yeah. It's a, a big topic like you said a rabbit hole let's let's move a little bit um 
you mentioned that there's there's a good chance that a handful of years from now you might look back at your book and, and disagree with some of the things you wrote. Anything that you can think of from five, seven years ago that you thought for sure was, you know, the, the right, the right belief, the right fact that, that now you look back and you disagree with? One thing that I've definitely changed on is just the idea that there is no one right investing strategy for everyone. There's a thousand different ways that you can invest that's right for you. And I, I've always had this belief that the majority of investing debates are not actually debates. It's people with different time horizons and different risk tolerances yelling over one another. And most of the time when someone says, uh, you should buy this stock, you should sell this stock, you have to ask the question, who are you talking to? Are you talking to a 17-year-old day trader? Are you talking to an 80-year-old widow on a fixed income? Like, let's not pretend that this strategy is going to be right for that person. And so I think I've changed my mind of of realizing that people who I used to disagree with and said, I used to think, or used to say, your investing strategy is wrong. What you're doing is wrong and you should do what I do because that's the right way. That's not something that I by and large believe, believe anymore. And I, I think, you know, do, do people have bad investing strategies? Yes. Do they earn investing strategies that are unlikely to work? Yes, of course. But I, I'm much more likely to be like, hey, if it works for you, then it works for you. I think there's a lot of people that have a gambling mentality ingrained in them. And dollar cost averaging in index funds is not going to work for them because it's too boring. It's just not going to work for their personality. So if for that person, you can set aside 10% or whatever of your net worth to day trade penny stocks or whatever it would be, like that's the right strategy for that person. So I think rather than preaching and saying, this is right, this is wrong, it's just much more open-minded and saying, hey, we all just have to figure out whatever works for us. I know that there are that the way I invest would not work for maybe a lot of you. And the way you invest would not work for me. And again, that's not because we disagree with each other or because one of us is less intelligent. I just think like everyone's got a different personality has to figure it out for themselves. And you're aware there are a lot of financial advisors, financial professionals on this call. Does that mean it's important to find the right clients that agree with your strategy or to adopt your strategy to whoever you're speaking with? How do you, how do you coach somebody like that up? I remember the story many years ago from Barry Ritholtz. I think he's told this publicly, but he had a client that came to him many years ago and said, Barry, I'm going to give half my money to you and half to this other advisor. And after six months, the advisor who has earned the highest returns gets, gets the other half, like wins, wins the whole pot. And Barry was like, this is never going to work. Like, we, like no, thank you. Don't, don't want you as a client. And I think that's, that is... Uh, that's really smart. And a lot of the best investors will do that. A lot of the best fund managers, financial advisors who have no problem firing clients. And they do it politely and with dignity. And just say like, look, this is not going to work. Back to what I said earlier, if you're a fund manager and you have to kind of pander to your client's expectations, like your, your hands are tied, your hands are handcuffed at that point. And so there's this other great story that I love from Daniel Kahneman, where after he won the Nobel Prize, uh, you win a chunk of money after, after you do that. And he went to his financial advisor and he said, I have no desire for more money. I just want to live out the rest of my days off of this, some of this, this pot of money that I built. And the financial advisor said, I can't work with you. Like she fired him. And to him, that was so curious because he, he viewed it as it was so interesting that the financial advisor could not understand that most people, that someone like him would not want to take a lot of risks. Someone in his 80s who had a pot of money didn't want to take any more risk, but for him, that's what he wanted. But I actually think the financial advisor may have done the right thing. Like it's great to look at a client and just say, like, this is going to work. Now, in the AUM industry, where your fees are based by and large off of AUM, that's a tough thing for people to do. But the most successful advisors and portfolio managers have all done that. They view it as not just a race to gather AUM, but like who can we actually partner with for the longest time? And the, the irony is that the advisors and fund managers who do that are going to end up with the highest income from themselves because a client who sticks with you for 20 years is so much more valuable than a client that's hot money and is going to stick with you for six months until you have a down month and they're going to pull their money out and run. Sure. Or we talked about your, your blog briefly in the, in the, at the top of the, the webinar here. Um, Michael Antonelli wants to know what's your favorite blog post you've, you've ever written? Uh, oh, that's, that, that's, that's a tough one. I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll think about anything, it here. anything that you just, well, you know, super one, memorable sticks in there. One that, that, uh, that really sticks out is, um, uh, the book psychology of money was a derivative. It was born from a blog post called the psychology of money that I wrote in 2018. And it was a, a very, very long blog post. It's almost 10,000 words. Um, 
and that's that's the genesis of the book. So that's a blog post that you know had a, a big impact on my career. And the post too was, I just. I, I just wanted to come up with what were the 20 anecdotes, little stories and little beliefs that I had that were most powerful in behavioral finance. I'm just going to lay those out. And I, I, I shamelessly stole the title from a Charlie Munger speech called The Psychology of Human Misjudgment that he gave back in the 1990s. I thought that was such a genius title, The Psychology of Blank. And so that's where I got the title from. And I think you could do that for almost any topic. Like somebody could write The Psychology of Sports, The Psychology of Medicine, The Psychology of Politics, where you're not looking at what you should do. You're looking at what happens inside of people's heads when they try to do it, which is to me, that that was a basis of the psychology of money. So just on the impact that that had on my career, that's, that's really what sticks out. All right. You mentioned Munger again, you've mentioned, you know, Buffett a couple of times, anybody else that you really look up to when it comes to investing or how they think about finance? Uh, there, there's a, there's a hedge fund manager named Monish Pabrai who I've, I've looked up to for a very long time. He's a really successful hedge fund manager. He's not necessarily a household name. And one of the reasons he's not is because he capped his hedge fund at a fairly small AUM, which I always had so much admiration for that. There's, so, like, there's a long history of when you're a small fund manager, you earn really high returns. And then when you earn high returns, you can, you can raise a lot of money. And then when you raise a lot of money, you can't earn high returns anymore and everything kind of falls apart. And to like, go out of your way to proactively prevent that by capping your fund at a, at, at a, at a rate, that's, that's always really stuck out to me. The other thing, the people who I admire most in life are people who quit while they're ahead. So forget about um, finance and investors. Like I, I mentioned before, what Jerry Seinfeld did when he had the, the biggest TV show of all time and he was on top of the world, he just said, we're done. Pull the plug. We're out of here. And Jack Welch offered him personally $100 million to do a, one more season of Seinfeld. And he said, no, we're done. And he talked about why that was. It was what made Seinfeld so great was he and Larry David would go out and observe society. They would go watch like how people were ordering their sandwiches at a deli or how people boarded the subway. And that's where their material came from. And as he became more famous and more busy, they, they couldn't do that anymore. And he said, the only way you can know where the top is in the show is to experience the decline. And he had no interest in that. So quitting while you're ahead is, is really powerful. There's another, so I, I grew up as a competitive ski racer. Ski racing is not big in the United States, but in Europe, it's like, it's the basketball of Europe. So for the last decade, the greatest male skier is a guy named Marcel Hirscher from Austria. And he was, he was just completely untouchable. He was like the, I mean, you know, there's, he's like the Michael Jordan, LeBron James of, of his field. And he quit while he was ahead. I think he quit in 2019 or so. And he was at the top of his game. He easily could have had another five or 10 years left in his career. And he said, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here after he had his greatest season ever. And they asked him why that was. And he said, I want to go spend my time hanging out with my son and riding my bike. And like, I've achieved everything I want. And it takes so much willpower to quit while you're ahead that the people who do it, I really have a lot of admiration for. I grew up in Detroit when Barry Sanders was in his prime and, and he quit and I'm still sad about it, but maybe, maybe it's, there. <laughs> it's sad, but the alternative are people who kind of fizzle out. And Michael Jordan kind of did that when he came back and like his last game, his last season, you're like, uh, okay. But like, he was so great before that it was still like, but there are other athletes who their last seasons, their last games, it's just kind of a sad shell of who they used to be. And I don't fault them for that. They can still have an amazing career, but the people who proactively prevent that, it's so hard that I have a lot of respect for it. Yeah. Um, another question that came in here. So how do you balance the notion of chasing higher income, saving for the future, but also spending what you have now so that you can enjoy life. And, and how do you coach people up on that? Different for everyone. So there's no like firm one size fits all answer here. I mean, to get not, not too like extreme and morbid about this, but the question I think everyone should ask is like, if you are on your deathbed tomorrow, what would you regret? That's the Jeff Bezos regret minimization framework of how to make decisions. And I've always been a pretty big saver not a huge spender. I, I don't consider myself frugal. We have a pretty good life, but I've always had a, a high savings rate. And for me that if I were on my deathbed tomorrow, I would regret absolutely none of it because I would take so much pride and pleasure knowing that my wife and kids are going to be okay because we've saved money. So that's, I mean, I don't mean to get too morbid about it, but I think that's, that's a question to ask is like in the extreme scenario, what would you regret? And I think there were people who would ask that question if they're super savers or they're like, they're like in the fire movement that if they were on their deathbed tomorrow, they would say, I should have traveled more. I wish I had opened up. I wish I went out for dinner with my friends more often. And 
if that's you, then like that that's your cue to listen up. I think it's a really effective framework for how to think about this. Sounds um another question came in. So what what would you say is is a good way to talk to investors to help them lengthen their investment timeline, but especially during market volatility, right? I think everybody's willing to stay invested when the market is uh is strong, you a bull market, but but what are some words of advice you can give to people during during volatility or a bear market to keep that timeline long? Well, to me, the, the most important investing statistics that exist is the prevalence of volatility. And I found that even if you're a professional investor or advisor, a lot of people don't understand or not aware how common volatility is. And we have over 100 years of good market data in the United States. And you look at it and it's the average uh, time between 10% declines is 11 months. So every 11 months on average, there's a 10% decline. You have a 20% decline every two or three years on average, a 30% decline at least once per decade on average. So if you're an investor like me who hopes to be investing for the next 50 years, well, if I'm lucky, I'm going to have five or more 30% plus declines. And I think once you realize how prevalent it is, then you're like, like it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. But it's always this case of when the market declines, it's easy to think the market's broken. There's a, there's a catastrophe and like it's broken and, and like this shouldn't be happening. And when you realize that during the last hundred years, when the market is up literally 200 fold, including dividends over the last hundred years, and it's declined 30% or more 10 times during that period, you see how common it is. The other part is changing the mindset from volatility being a fine, which is something that you did, something that you're in trouble for. Like if you get a fine, it's because you made a mistake and you're in trouble and you got caught to a fee. A fee is just the cost of admission for getting something. And obviously volatility is the cost of admission for doing well at investing. And when you shift that mentality from a 30% decline means you or your advisor screwed up and did something wrong towards, oh, this is the cost of admission that I need to be willing to pay to do well over time. Just that little mindset shift, I think makes it so, again, like it's not fun to go through the declines, but it makes it a little bit more palatable to stick it through. But I think there is an important point to recognize too, that you know, every, every past decline looks like a risk. Sorry, every past decline looks like an opportunity and every future decline looks like a risk. That's always the case. And it's much easier for, pe for people to say, I will be greedy when others are fearful than it is to actually do it. Like most of the time when you have a major decline, a lot of people realize that they are the, the others that Buffett was talking about when he made that quote. And so if you are the kind of person who panicked in 2008 or March of 2020, and of course not everybody is, but if you are, most of the evidence will show that that's, that's what you're going to do next time, that you're probably not going to learn from your mistake. And I think it's important for investors and advisors to realize that that's okay. If you identify that that's who you are, you should just probably have a lower, a less risky allocation than you did last time, rather than pretending that we can fix like the dopamine and cortisol in our brain that makes us panic during these periods, just to embrace that that's who you are. I have a more conservative risk tolerance than most people of my age and income would. And most financial advisors would look at me and say, hey, you could probably afford to take some more risk here. But I don't because I've just become, I think I'm pretty aware of what my personality is around this stuff. And that my goal is not to earn the highest returns. It's to sleep well at night and to have endurance over the next 50 years. So it's just figuring out who you are and, and kind of embracing that rather than assuming you can fix it. Yeah. And when it comes to telling that story about, you know, time frame and, you know, you mentioned that one out of every 11 months or something like that is a down month. I mean, there's just so many good ways you can visualize that data to help tell that story. So, um, you know, hopefully some of the charts and things that, uh, you know, we publish can help help people with that task too. But uh, one more question I've got for you before we let you go, Morgan, as we get close to the, uh, the bottom of the hour here, top of the hour, I guess. Um, Tell us about, about the book that's coming out, Same as Ever. Is, is that going to be kind of an extension of the, the concepts you wrote about in Psychology of Money, or is it something different? I think one way to think about it is Psychology of Money is the psychology of you, the individual, like what's going on inside of your head. And Same, in the, same as Ever is really the psychology of us as a society, like what keeps happening in the world over and over again. That was true a thousand years ago, and it'll be true a thousand years from now. What, what happens in society inside of people's minds that, uh, that will never change. And there's so much focus, especially in the financial industry on what's going to change. Like what's the next new industry? What's the next new, new company? And I, I just think it's much more powerful and accurate when you're thinking about the future to just ask what's never going to be, what's never going to change. What are we hundred percent sure is going to be part of our future 
10, 20, 30 years from now versus pretending that we can predict what is going to change. That's, that's really what the book's about. Well, I'm excited. I, I think a lot of people are. So um, wish you the best of luck. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if, if we find a couple of questions we can get to, we'll, we'll do our best to follow up offline. But, um, you know, any, anything you want to close with, take away, Morgan. But otherwise, you know, thank you so much for joining us. I hope everybody. Now, yeah, this, this has been fun. It's, a, it's an honor to get to do this. So thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here for the last hour. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.